So hello everyone, welcome to the uh, actually first seminar in this academic year in our series, long-standing series. Uh, we are meeting uh, more and more online and a few more people will be joining us in a, uh, in a few minutes. Uh, so in the room, there, there isn't that many people, but, uh, but online, yes. Uh, our speaker today is connecting uh, from uh, the US, from Duke University, uh, Daniel Makshi. She yeah, uh, if yeah. I'm correct, uh, pronouncing correctly. Uh, yes. well, he will be speaking in the in this kind of sub series of the seminars that we are having, uh, um, oriented on uh, the understanding of goal directedness or goal orientedness uh, uh, that we are focused in one of the projects that we are running. The uh, the project run for the uh, um, supported by the Templeton Foundation. Uh, and uh, it's it seems it's going to be very interesting because uh, from from the um, from the abstract that you wrote, you you are calling your own hypothesis outrageous. So it's it's you know sounds promising <laughs> when <laughs> when the author says that <laughs> it will be uh, it will be interesting for for us to follow. So uh, so then uh, the floor is yours. Uh, I will. Go to to the other side of the room, so the the camera will be on the on the audience, and uh, in a few moments, uh, more people will be joining. So uh, sure, yeah. Okay. So, so all all yours now. Yeah. Okay. So thank you for inviting me. I'm looking forward to the critical feedback on my outrageous hypothesis on my outrageous theory. Um, I'm talking to you from not quite the middle, soon to be the middle of a hurricane that's coming up from Florida. And I gather it was pretty devastating for the people down in Florida, hopefully less so for us. We're 150 miles inland here, maybe 200 given the trajectory of the hurricane. That should be enough to slow it down. And I actually could and thought at the last minute of turning this into a talk on agency and autonomy uh, with respect to hurricanes, but I don't think I could pull it together that fast. Um, <clears throat> I want to comment on the question mark in the title. Uh, a possible title for this talk was Teleology, All Goal-Directed Systems Have the Same Architecture, period. A firm declarative uh, that would invite all kinds of um, nasty feedback, which I'm looking forward to. Um, <clears throat> I decided not to do that. I also decided not just to slap a question mark on the end all by itself, because that suggests I really don't know whether all goal-directed systems have the same architecture. I'm raising, just raising the question. And actually, my stance is more solid than that. I think I'm probably right that they all have the same architecture, but I'm leaving a little wiggle room. This is a tough topic, um, and anybody who makes strong declarative statements is asking for trouble. Uh, by the way, this looks like a small enough group, um, and we, I gather we've got some time. Um, I'm happy to be interrupted at any point with questions, comments, objections, complaints, anything at all. Um, though I left a lot, left a lot of time at the end for just that sort of thing, so you can wait till the end or interrupt me as you see see fit. So let me. I'm going to start with an example of goal directedness. Um, and actually, this is not my focal example. It's just a, a, a recent example, something that was recently um, in the journals, and it's just too cool, too sweet, too pretty, not to mention it, at least in passing. It turns out that sea turtles, loggerhead sea turtles along the east coast um, of America, uh, southeast coast of America, uh, home, go back to their natal beaches using uh, lines of magnetic field intensity. The Earth's magnetic field is what they're tracking. The map you see on the right shows um, isoclines, um, lines of constant magnetic field. The dots along the coast of Florida show the nesting grounds for loggerhead turtles. So they, they nest in each one of those uh, black dots. Uh, the little turtles swim, uh, sorry, uh, crawl across the sand, swim out into the ocean feed, and then when it's time to breed, they find their way back, not just to the coast, but to their exact, the exact beach on which they were hatched. How do they do this? Uh, this I won't go into the mechanism. It's not really known in any detail, um, <clears throat> but they do it by tracking the Earth's uh, magnetic field, by tracking the intensity of the field. 
one of the nice things, one of the really cool things about this study is you see those dots over on the west coast of Florida, one, two, three, four, five on the west coast of Florida. Those are mistakes. Those are cases where turtle populations have been founded because the animal couldn't distinguish east from west, as you can't if you're following magnetic isoclines. Um, and they ended up on the wrong side of Florida and decided to uh, make nests there anyway. Okay, so moving on to the example I'm really starting with. <clears throat> Hypothetically, imagine someone throws a peanut butter sandwich into a pond and the sandwich falls into the pond and the peanut butter contains um, um, aspartate chemical which seeps out into the water forming this gradient of aspartate concentration. And that's what the red dashed lines are supposed to show you. A food field, a food gradient uh, for whom? For that bacterium over on the upper left, the one with uh, that is not in, to scale with a peanut butter sandwich, by the way, uh, with a flagellum sticking out to the left. And what you see there, the arrow shows the trajectory of the bacterium up the concentration gradient toward the peanut butter sandwich. Okay, um, and I'm going to argue that this is a goal-directed system. It's a goal-directed system. Um, you can tell it's a goal-directed system on account of two features of it, namely two features of the behavior of the bacterium. Uh, this comes from Sommerhoff and Nagel, um, 20th century philosophers. The bacterium shows persistence, which is returning to a trajectory after perturbation. So let me go back here. You can see that the path up the gradient, up the food gradient isn't straight, it's twisty curvy. It's actually way more twisty curvy than that. The thing makes all kinds of errors um, and corrects for them. Um, <clears throat> so persistence is returning to a trajectory toward the goal despite perturbations. Perturbation takes it off course, the thing corrects, that's persistence. Then there's plasticity, which is finding a certain trajectory from a wide range of starting points. Let me go back to this original picture. There's a lot of places in that food field where the bacterium could start and still find its way up a food gradient, up that food gradient, right? Um, so that's plasticity, a certain amount of indifference to starting point. It's not complete indifference. There's lots of places it could start that would be outside the food field and it wouldn't find its way up the gradient, but there's also lots of places where it could. By the way, Sommerhoff and Nagel define goal-directed systems it, partly in terms of persistence and plasticity. I'm not doing that. Um, I'm just calling them signature behaviors, hallmarks of goal-directed systems. They show this persistence and plasticity. As you'll see as we proceed here, um, I don't offer a definition of goal-directedness, and there's, I'll get to this, there's a good reason for that. <clears throat> Okay, um, my outrageous hypothesis, I'm calling uh, field theory, I should say we're calling, um, I came up with the, uh, this view back in 2012 and have been working on it since recently joined by Gunnar Babcock. We have a couple of papers out recently on field theory. And here's a sort of rough statement of it. Um, an entity, the field theory claims that an entity with some appropriate internal mechanism in this case, a bacterium, moves within a higher level field, in this case, the food gradient, which contains and directs it from above, producing persistence and plasticity. So I'm going to unpack some of these terms over the course of the next 20 minutes or so, um, including things like field and internal mechanism and containment and direction and so forth. Uh, but here I'm just providing sort of general statement. And here's the claim. There are five big categories of goal-directed systems. Uh, if anybody can think of a sixth, I'm all ears, I'd love to hear it. I have a feeling there, there may be more. Uh, but roughly they fall into five categories. There's the physiological slash behavioral, like the bacterium going up a food gradient, like a sunflower turning throughout the day to face the sun like homeostatic systems inside organisms. Um, they, they all show, or many of them show persistence and plasticity. Then there's a bunch of technological examples, um, homing torpedo, GPS on a self-driving car and so on. And I'll be spending more time on these in the first half of the talk. 
Then the sort of classic goal-directed system, the original one going back to Aristotle, development um, is goal-directed. It shows persistence and plasticity, returning to a trajectory toward the adult despite perturbation. Um, and I'll be giving a bunch of examples um, of that. <clears throat> Two more, um, adaptation by natural selection or what you might call evolutionary goal-directedness and human intentionality, wanting, preferring, caring, intending, and so on. Um, I think these are goal-directed systems. What's interesting is that they've been kind of orphaned from most people's thinking about goal-directedness. Evolutionary adaptation has been already declared by evolutionary biology not to be goal-directed. Pick up any textbook or go online and just search it. You'll find some emphatic declaration that adaptation is not goal-directed. I'm arguing it is. Um, goal directed, that it falls neatly within um, not just uh, the persistence and plasticity um, standard, but uh, field theory explains it nicely. And then going further out on a limb, I'm going to argue that human intentionality is also explained uh, by field theory. So these two, evolutionary um, adaptation and human intention intentionality, even if they're considered goal directed, um, <clears throat> they typically are not classed with the others. They're set apart in some way. One of the big virtues of this. Me. <laughs> Can you hear me? Hello? OK. Was that a question? I couldn't tell. Um, <clears throat> they're set apart in some way. And one of the virtues, I think, of, of, of field theory is that it unifies them. It provides a unified account of, of goal directedness. OK, goal directedness, teleology, purpose. They're typically all used at roughly as synonyms, slightly tinged differently, depending on who you're talking to, depending on the context. I'm using them all interchangeably in this talk. I'm gonna stick mostly with the more technical sounding goal directedness over teleology and purpose, but I don't see a lot of space between those terms um, in the way that they're being used today anyway in the philosophical literature. Well, there's a, timeless mystery that goes with uh, goal directedness, that goes with teleology. How does it work? Because it looks just crazy on the surface if you stop and think about it, or maybe if you don't stop and think about it, it looks just crazy on the surface. It looks like a case of the future causing the past. That peanut butter sandwich in the pond with the aspartate le leaching out of it seems to, is in the future for the bacterium. It's not there, it's not there yet. Worse, it may never get there. But there's the peanut butter sandwich directing it. I'm gonna argue that the peanut butter sandwich is not directing it, but it sure looks like a case of something in the future directing past events, right? In an example I'll recur to, I know that there's a delicious piece of cheesecake sitting in the fridge um, at this moment. Um, <clears throat> I would like to go get it. That piece of cheesecake, if I go get it, is in my future. How could it possibly be directing events now? Right? The future can't cause the past. The problem was declared unsolvable by Kant. Um, <clears throat> but in the past hundred years or so, many people have declared it solved by Darwin. And I'm gonna argue that that's not the case. I'm gonna give you a brief in passing argument that that's not the case. Darwin did solve part of the problem of teleology, he solved the problem of where it comes from, solved the problem of function, adaptation, how it evolves. What he didn't solve, what he didn't even address was the problem of how it works. What's, what's the architecture of goal directedness in the moment? Forget how it came to be in the bacterium, forget how it came to be in me. Um, in the moment, how does it work? Um, and that's not a question that, that Darwin addressed. Field theory, um, it has five components. Actually, it has 10 components or 15, depending on how you wanna break them down. Five, I wanna draw attention to, actually only three for purposes of this talk that I'm gonna draw attention to. Um, but however many I, uh, I put up there, however many I go through, the argument is going to be that all goal-directed systems share, them, share all of these. The architecture is the same for all of them. So the first one is hierarchy, and by hierarchy, I mean nestedness, things within things, objects within objects. Think Chinese dolls, think Russian boxes, uh, sorry, Russian dolls and Chinese boxes. Um, 
And we're not talking about hierarchy in the many other senses in which that word is used. So for example, there are specification hierarchies. A postal address is a specification hierarchy with the first line being the person's name, the most specific, and the last line being the city or the state or the country, uh, the least specific. And we move from most specific to least specific as we go down this specification hierarchy. I do not mean hierarchy in that sense. There's another sense in which I don't mean it. There are command hierarchies. So in a military unit, there are, let's say, uh, lieutenants and sergeants and corporals and enlisted men. Um, <clears throat> and everybody knows lieutenants give orders to sergeants who give orders to corporals who give orders to enlisted men. It's a hierarchy, but it's a command hierarchy. And it turns out that corporals are not physically nested inside sergeants and sergeants are not physically nested inside lieutenants. It's not hierarchy in the sense in which I'm talking about. Um, it's not nestedness. Upper direction, and I'm gonna have more to say about all of these. This is just the um, uh, introductory slide where I'm introducing the key ingredients of, of the architecture. Um, upper direction, the claim is gonna be that upper level fields act causally on contained lower level entities, directing them, telling them where to go, or in terms I'm not totally happy with, providing the information that the lower level entity needs to get where it's going. Um, again, I'll say more about that. And I'll also say that it explains persistence and plasticity. Um, the reason that bacterium is able to go up the food gradient toward the peanut butter sandwich is because the field is everywhere, because that upper direction is available to it across a wide swath of space in which it could wander. So accidents will happen to it, it gets deflected this way and that, but wherever it goes, there's the upper level field and it's got to be big, it's got to be out there, and it's got to be outside, it's, sorry, the bacterium has to be nested within it um, in order for it to explain persistence and plasticity. Uh, partial freedom of the contained goal-directed entity. I'm going to argue that freedom, in the sense in which um, I'm using it, is partial independence from an upper level field, what that means in the case of the bacterium going up the food gradient is that every run is different in detail. Every bacterium uh, going up that food gradient is gonna have a different trajectory to, to it, all sharing the common feature of being up the food gradient. Critically, the field doesn't control. Uh, control is the wrong word. Control implies determination of every single aspect of it. And the field doesn't tell the bacterium exactly what to do. It nudges it, it guides it, it directs it um, <clears throat> without actually controlling it. And that's where partial freedom comes in. The bacterium has to be free. The lower level entity, the lower level goal directed entity has to be somewhat free of the upper level field in order for us to have goal directedness. Um, the two remaining ones on this list, uh, the relative stability of the field, I'll just say a few words about it um, and then I'll abandon it for the rest of the talk. That food gradient, that uh, field had better be pretty stable relative to the time scale, the movement of the bacteria, bacterium, or it's not going to be able to be persistent in plastic. If the field is varying wildly, if there are currents carrying the uh, food molecules this way and that, hither and thither, um, <clears throat> the bacterium is not going to be able to behave in a goal-directed way. The upper level field has to be stable on the time scale of the bacterium's movement. Um, and vagueness, we can talk about at the end if anybody uh, wants to raise it, but I'm not going to here. Okay. Okay, hierarchy in the sense of physical nestedness. I've already taken you down that path. Um, this is inspired, all of this work really is inspired by hierarchy theory in the sense of Stan Salty and Bill Wimsatt. Herbert Simon, Donald Campbell, um, and um, James Feibelman, who wrote one beautiful paper back in the 50s laying out the properties of these of hierarchical systems. Um, so they all mean uh, hierarchy in my sense of the word, and they all have really interesting things to say about it. Feibelman actually talks about um, goal-directedness. 
So just to contrast hierarchical views of goal-directed systems with non-hierarchical ones, uh, let me throw three non-hierarchical, non-hierarchical, harder to say than it is to read, uh, views of the uh, bacterium in the food gradient at you. You could argue that the sandwich is the source of direction, uh, but obviously that's nonsense. The sandwich is far away, removed in time and space, relative to the bacterium in the moment. It can't see the sandwich. It can't smell the sandwich. The sandwich is not part of its world. The only thing that's part of its world is the food gradient. And what's more, the sandwich is in the future and we can't have the future directing the past. So the sandwich can't be the source of direction, but that isn't the direction uh, that most people would go, want to go. Um, <clears throat> integrative biology taking on this problem would probably talk about internal mechanisms of the bacterium as the source of direction. Uh, but I want to argue that that doesn't work either because those internal mechanisms, while they're very necessary to the bacterium doing what it does, and really interestingly complicated, um, despite the small size of the thing, it's got some fancy molecular pathways involved in simply tracking, uh, finding a trajectory up a gradient. Nothing in those internal mechanisms gives it the slightest bit of information about which way to go. Without the field, without the food field, this thing wanders, actually performs technically a random walk um, in the space in which it's, in, in which it's moving. So internal mechanisms are lovely and they're important, but they're not a source of direction in the sense in which I, they don't guide. <clears throat> uh, then, um, especially in mid 20th century, in the mid 20th century field cybernetics, there was a lot of talk about feedback mechanisms and feedback mechanisms can be, uh, though need not be involved in goal directed systems. Um, the architecture of these things, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later on. The architecture of feedback mechanisms as understood by cybernetics is too flat. And actually I'm gonna cut, cut myself off from saying anything more about it till we get um, later in the talk. Um, and I'll distinguish this view from the cybernetic view more clearly. So the hierarchical view, again, um, an entity with some appropriate internal mechanism, not downplaying the importance of the internal mechanism. Those are important. In this case, the entity is the bacterium, moves within a higher level system. In this case, it's the food gradient, which contains it and directs it from above. And the argument is this explains um, how goal-directed systems of all kinds do it. Okay, that was hierarchy. Moving on to upper direction <clears throat> and partial freedom, which I'm gonna treat together initially and then separate out in a few slides from now. Imagine a balloon, a helium filled balloon, exactly weighted so that it hovers neutrally in a room. So you walk into a room and there's a balloon hanging in the air in front of you, not going up, not going down, not going sideways, just hanging there. And it's got some helium in it. And what the white arrow shows here is the trajectory of some one helium atom within the balloon. And I'm gonna walk through persistence and plasticity and upper direction and partial freedom using this example and then using a bunch of other examples. So what happens if you walk up to the balloon and grab it with both hands and move it to somewhere else in the room? That's all this figure is supposed to show is somebody taking the balloon and moving it somewhere else in the room following that trajectory. The whole system is being moved <coughs> here. <clears throat> what this is trying to show is the pathway of that helium molecule, <clears throat> tracking the balloon, following the balloon. <clears throat> There's persistence. You can see persistence all over that trajectory. It's following the center of the balloon roughly, but it's making all kinds of errors, meaning it's bumping into other helium atoms that are deflecting it away from a path following the center of the balloon always within the balloon, but making enormous numbers of errors and always returning on average to a traje trajectory that tracks the center of the balloon, right? That's where, the, that's where that helium um, atom is on average. So that's persistence. There's also plasticity. Any helium atom starting anywhere within that balloon is gonna follow a trajectory something like this, not in detail, 
um, <clears throat> uh, but on average, they're gonna follow a trajectory like this. Upper direction. This is not like the food field. It's different because the field in this case, and I have a fairly permissive understanding of fields work here, I'll say more about that. The field is the plastic skin of the balloon. Really, it's the whole system, but it's easier to talk about as the plastic skin of the balloon. A boundary is the field. It's a boundary condition on the system. Um, and the field, the plastic skin, is what determines, sorry, determines is the wrong word, guides, directs the trajectory of the, um, of the helium atom. So that's the upper direction. It's coming from the field. It's coming from the skin of the balloon. What's partial freedom? It's all those zigs and zags you can see in the trajectory there. The, that helium atom is free, 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 bouncing this way and that, hitting a helium atom, hitting another helium atom, hitting the wall of the balloon, another helium atom. Life is great. I can go anywhere I want. Bang, 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 except, says the balloon. We're anthropomorphizing a little here. S says the balloon in a deep voice, except you can't go beyond this boundary, right? So lots of freedom here, lots of independence from the upper level field, but also considerable dependence on it. Okay. And I was gonna introduce, no, I wanna save that for later. Okay, <clears throat> another example, very different example from both the bacterium um, and, the, and the balloon case. Consider a single buffalo in a herd of buffalo. And I don't know if you've either seen videos about, it, maybe you've seen these things in person when they're in herds, they move very slowly across the landscape, uh, munching on grass as they go, babies following mom, and mom following the herd in general. She doesn't follow the herd moment to moment. There's a nice bit of grass, mm, I'll eat that. Ooh, is that a predator over there on the hillside? Where's baby? Her attention is diverted. She wanders in front of baby for, to protect it maybe. Oh, no, that's not a predator. Oh, there's another bit of grass and she wanders somewhere else. She's pretty free, right? But there's this boundary condition that arises from her psychology um, that tells her on average, in general, not minute to minute, but hour to hour, follow the herd, right? And so she follows it, following this zigzag trajectory that's on average with the center of the herd. Um, this is a kind of goal directedness. There's persistence and plasticity. Um, <clears throat> she deflects, she goes off on a little tangent somewhere to find, some, find a nice little field, but she comes back to the herd. And what's more, it's plastic because it applies to every animal in the herd. Okay, freedom, upper direction by the herd. Another example, a technological one, a homing torpedo. Uh, you see a target ship over there on the right. You see a submarine launching a torpedo. Where's the field? Well, the field is the sound field coming off the target ship. And once the torpedo enters the sound field, its behavior can be persistent and it can deviate like, suppose the, the sound detecting mechanism in the torpedo detects a passing pod of whales that it mistakes for the target ship and it takes a little turn toward the whales. Fine, the whales disappear. They go silent and there it is still in the sound field of the target ship and it corrects and goes back, right? So it's persistent. Despite perturbations, it comes back to a trajectory toward or rather up the, uh, up the sound field gradient. Um, and plastic because it can be launched from any one of a number of locations provided they're in the sound field. By the way, nothing certain about all this. If that passing pot, pot of whales drew the torpedo out of the sound field of the target ship, well, that's life. That torpedo is not going to find its target, right? Um, so there's no guarantees here in goal-directed systems. They need not get to their goals. Uh, in general, they will. This is how they do it, when they do it. <clears throat> we've got upper direction by the sound field of the target ship, and we've got partial freedom. Uh, the torpedo is free to wander within the sound field and real torpedoes do, not driven by pods of whale, but by ocean currents, um, <clears throat> but they correct for those. Okay, self-driving car. We got a really fancy goal-directed system here. <clears throat> What's the upper level field? 
Well, it's the, the field, the microwave field coming off the cell tower that's doing the directing or coming from a satellite in some cases. But let's just think of it as a car in a city with a cell tower that's emitting a microwave field. Its GPS system is connected to that field and can detect it from anywhere in the field and gives directions to the self-driving car to turn left, to turn right, and so on, right? The directions have to come from the field because the car itself doesn't know anything about where it is in the city otherwise, and it can only behave randomly otherwise. So there's gonna be errors here, and the errors are gonna take the form of uh, the car goes over a pothole and swerves slightly, right? Well, you know, it doesn't know that. It can't know that, or, or rather, sorry, there are ways in which it could know that, but that's not the way it works. It just detects the field again and gets back on track. Actually, the error correcting mechanisms tend to be a separate system within the car rather than using the field, but let's not worry about that right now. It's a persistent and plastic system. You can start from anywhere in the city and get to the destination. Upper direction is coming from the microwave field. Partial freedom means it can make errors. Um, and still correct for them. The errors, by the way, I've got to, I should put errors in quotes because some of the errors are only with respect to the microwave field. So if the car stops because a pedestrian walks into its path, from the perspective of the upper level field, that's an error. It didn't get directions to stop, right? It was a local decision, like the helium atom bumping into another helium atom. It was a local direction that it got from mechanisms inside the car, stop when you see pedestrians, right? From the perspective of the, of, the, of the field, that's a deviation. And it looks down on the car and anthropomorphizing like crazy says to itself, that's an error. I can make it correct for that. So the pedestrian passes, the car starts up again and continues on its path. And that's the <clears throat> persistence, excuse me. <clears throat> Okay, the next three slides, I'm gonna unpack the notions of uh, field and freedom a little bit more. Um, hang on, let me move this off to one side. I'm using field in Levin's sense. Um, he's a developmental biologist and <clears throat> he calls a field a structure that is non-local and that influences smaller entities contained within it. And I'm good with that. I'm very good with the notion of fields being non-local. I guess I just wanna add, it doesn't just influence, it directs them so they behave persistently and plastically for goal. He wasn't talking about goal directing this, I am. So I'm adding, it influences those smaller entities that make in a way that makes them behave persistently and plastically. Examples, and I'm just going to give you a blizzard of examples in the hope that the concept um, of a field emerges clearly from this longish list of examples. Um, an electric field containing a charged particle, and that's what the figure on the left is supposed to show. It's like the bacterium swimming up um, a food field. Plastic wall of the balloon surrounding a gas molecule. The food field, the actual bacterium um, in the food field. The buffalo herd, the sound field, the microwave field. How about this one? I walk by a bakery and there's a smell of bread coming out of it. I'm a passerby and the smell of the bread influences me um, to want bread and directs me to go into the bakery and maybe buy a loaf of bread. It doesn't control me. I don't have to go into the bakery. I might not, but it nudges me. It gives me a little push uh, given my psychology um, in the direction of going into the bakery. The bread smell is a smell field um, the entities contained within it are the potential consumers uh, passing through this food field. Now, I expect that one will be relatively uncontroversial. Let me take what I think of structurally as the same example, um, but increase the scale and make it a little more uncertain. Suppose there's an advertising campaign uh, going on. Some bank nationwide is offering especially low interest rates in an effort to induce people to buy houses, mortgage interest rates. And they launch this nationwide advertising campaign consisting of billboards, online ads, newspaper ads, et cetera. All that's out there in the world. I'm calling that a field. It's a non-local structure 
what's the structure? It's the combination of the online ads, the newspaper ads, the bill, everything. That whole package is the, <clears throat> is the non-local structure. And passing through it, passing through it, really? Yes, are entities, the consumers, who may or may not be influenced by it. They'll be given nudges, which they can't ignore um, in the direction of buying a house. Now, unlike the bread smell, unlike the microwave feel, unlike virtually all the examples, well, actually the buffalo herd is in this category too. Um, <clears throat> the field is discontinuous. If I'm driving on the highway and my cell phone is off and I'm not seeing a billboard, where's the field? Well, the field has, at a certain scale, at the scale of the whole country, at the scale of a whole state or a whole city, is pretty continuous. It's a matter of, of scale perspective here. If we zoom out far enough, we'll see the, the field and it'll look pretty continuous. Yes, there's gonna be plenty of places within it where you're, the campaign is not reaching you um, and that's fine. Fields don't have to be strictly speaking continuous at all scales. They just have to be continuous um, at, a, at some scale at which they could influence um, <clears throat> the entity within them. By the way, the buffalo herd is also not continuous. There are plenty of places where mom could be grazing on grass and not see the herd, not see a single other buffalo. Um, that doesn't matter. The herd is still there as she continues to wander, exercising her freedom. Um, she will find the herd um, and then it will influence her. So it's continuous enough. Other examples, um, morphogenetic gradients <clears throat> that envelop cells envelop genes, and I'll talk more about those in a moment. And then when I get to uh, talking about adaptation and natural selection, um, <clears throat> I'll argue that ecological settings constitute fields, that they envelop a species or a population and direct it from above. And then finally, of uh, the example, the set of examples I'm least confident in, um, but we'll you won't hear a change in my voice when I'm talking about them. I'm going to sound like I'm confident. Affective fields that envelop thought and behavior um, <clears throat> and um, guide and guide them from above. Okay, critically, from my perspective and <clears throat> not from everyone's who's talking about fields, they are physical. This is a causal account, right? A field is not an abstraction. It's not a metaphor. It's a thing. It may be a wildly dispersed thing uh, with lots of spaces between its components, but it's still a thing. And I just got, I did the continuity thing, so I don't have to say more about that. Okay. I've been using this term upper direction. Um, <clears throat> contrast, and I want to contrast it here with lateral direction, where upper direction refers to um, direction that comes from the containing system above. The examples I've used include food field, the balloon wall, morphogenetic gradient, the advertising campaign, and so on. Here are some cases of lateral direction. In other words, not upper direction. These are cases where the interactions among entities are about the same scale. Um, a billiard ball bumping into another billiard ball. Two people riding on a bus, the bus stops and one, care one person careens into another. That's a lateral interaction, two entities of about the same scale. Not true of their relationship with the bus, by the way. The bus is containing them and pulling them along. It's the field that's guiding both of them. But when they bump into each other, that's lateral direction. Nerve cells signaling another nerve cell, bird eating an insect, conversation over beer. If I'm sitting at the dinner table and ask somebody to pass the stuffing and they do it, that's a lateral, that's lateral interaction, that's lateral direction. Uh, there's no higher level field governing both of us. Well, the story is actually more complicated than that, but that's good enough for now. Okay, let me get this out of the way. Partial freedom. Freedom in the sense on which I'm using it is partial independence from the upper level field and it varies continuously. It comes in degrees. You're not either free or you're not. It's a matter of degree. So going back to the balloon example, um, the helium atom is partly free of the balloon, partly not. It has to stay within the skin of the balloon. How about those plastic molecules? They're a lot less free. The plastic in the skin of the balloon really has to follow the balloon. There's not much room for, yes, the balloon can spin. There's some freedom, it can rotate. And 
any given plastic molecule can move along the surface. Right? So there's some freedom there, but not nearly as much as there is for the um, helium atom inside the balloon. Again, freedom is always um, with respect to the field. There's no such thing as freedom per se in this view. The bacterium is partly free of the food gradient, gas molecules free of the balloon. Classic case of non-freedom, a prisoner um, in prison, uh, suppose they're released by the prison system, they are now free of the prison system, free of the legal system. It's a good example because they're not free in any other sense. They're not free with respect to any other field at the moment they're released from prison. Uh, they're still subject to all the laws of the state. They're subject to the social and economic fields that everybody else is immersed in. They're not absolutely free. They're free of one thing in particular. They're free of a particular field, which is the legal system, the prison system. And if anybody wants to bring it up in discussion, we can talk about what complete freedom could mean. Uh, I would argue that it's either randomness or it's absolutely meaningless, um, depending on how you frame it. Um, you will have noticed by now, and we'll be marshalling your arguments to claim out loud when we get to discussion that this is a, an oddly permissive is the phrase I use here. That's too generous to me. It's a crazy view of goal directedness. Really, I'm gonna argue that a particle in an electric field and a gas molecule in a balloon are goal directed just like the bacterium. And eventually I'm gonna argue just like a person, just like me going to get a piece of cheesecake from the fridge. And the answer is, yeah, they share the same architecture. And in that sense, field theory says they're both goal-directed. But, and here's the critical caveat, goal-directedness comes in degrees. So the particle in the electric field is boringly goal-directed. We know exactly how it works. Same with the gas molecule in the balloon. There's no mystery here. It's a very simple system you might wanna come up with measures of degrees of goal directedness based on the complexity of the system. That's one way to go. There are other ways to go. <clears throat> but yes, I am um, take, taking the outrageous view um, that all these things are goal directed in that they share the same architecture. Okay, uh, here are the five categories of goal directed systems. All my examples have been either physiological, behavioral or technological. I'm going to walk through some uh, developmental, um, looking at the time, I'm not sure. I, I'm aiming at nine o'clock to finish. Is that right, Marta? Yes, we have normally one hour for talk and one hour for the conversation, so. Okay, okay, let's see how it goes. I may speed up at the end because I, for me, me the, the back and forth with the discussion questions and challenges is, is more fun than, than the talk itself. Okay, five categories of goal directedness, three of them I have yet to get to. Let me give you some examples from development and then from evolutionary adaptation. So this is a nice example from sea urchin embryology. What you're looking at in A is a sea urchin embryo and those black ovals at the bottom are supposed to be a certain class of cells that collect at the south pole of the embryo in normal development. And in the course of normal development, they migrate up to the equator of the embryo, form a ring around the outside, and then uh, will eventually become the skeleton of the pluteus larva. So these are the future skeleton cells for the pluteus larva. Well, in some experiments done right here at Duke um, by Dave McClay and Greg Ray, they transplanted the cells from the South Pole to the North Pole. And that's what you're looking at in B. They just pluck those cells out with a micropipette one by one and stuck them in at the North Pole. And guess what? They migrated right to the equator and formed a normal skeleton for the pluteus larva. Uh, <clears throat> they don't know the precise substances involved. They don't know the substances involved at all. But the only thing that they come up with to explain it is that there's a gradient of some kind, uh, a field of some kind that's embryo-wide. This is huge, physically large from this perspective of the embryo. It encompasses the whole thing. How do we know it encompasses the whole thing? Because you can take a cell and put it anywhere, not just the North and the South Pole, put it anywhere inside the embryo and it'll find its way to the equator and distribute itself around the outside to form a, the pluteus skeleton. Another example, um, this is a nice one from Drosophila. You're looking at a Drosophila embryo, head on the left, tail on the right, and then a graph showing 
um, mRNA expression uh, patterns for a bunch of, um, of mRNAs, hunchback, caudal, bicoid, um, and nanos. And what's fun about B here, this graph showing the expression uh, <clears throat> domains, is that these are coming from mom, not from the embryo. This is an externally produced field produced by the egg itself, uh, sorry, produced by the cells around the egg. They set up this gradient and they are directing the embryo in the following way. Embryo, this is your head. Embryo, this is your tail. And they're starting a sequence of events that's gonna decide what those segments are. In other words, the whole body plan is being laid out by mom to start with, by cells around the, around the egg. Um, clearly external. <clears throat> it becomes internal very shortly. The embryo takes over its own DNA, starts manufacturing um, hunchback and caudal, um, and they have a continuous gradient from head to tail that you can see there in the red and the green with bicoid anos also changing their distributions. And we're just another step along here in the determination of those segments, this time coming from the embryo's genes, from the embryo cells. Well, you know, that doesn't sound much like a field, does it? Because it's not big. We're not talking about segments are large, right? Right. If I've got a field controlling this thing, it had better be embryo scale. And genes inside cells are not embryo scale. They're smaller than those segments. They're within those segments. So my argument says the genes aren't doing the directing. All they're doing is producing hunchback, caudal, bicoid, and nanos. All right. The gradient is what's doing the directing. And the gradient is big. It's embryo scale in size. The fact that the substances themselves come from the genes, come from the cells within them, does, doesn't make them directing fields. The field is the gradient. Okay. These are just a couple of beautiful examples from Levin. Uh, hang on, I better move this out of the way for myself. Right. <clears throat> um, the first one comes from deer, and it's showing you the antler of a deer that has suffered an injury. You see the uh, word injury with an arrow pointing to one, uh, one of those prongs has broken off. It turns out, you probably know, deer lose their antlers every year and grow new ones. In the same deer that regrows its antlers the next year, there will be some morphological perturbation at the site of the injury. I put at the site of the injury in heavy quotes because there is no site of the injury anymore. The antlers have been lost. New ones have been regrown. But something big has remembered, this is Levin's argument, has remembered that there was an injury there and is reproducing it and fixing it to the extent that it can at the same time, regenerating, trying to regenerate the original. Um, so this is not a gene level thing. The genes in the antlers are gone. That the antlers are lost. It's got to be something bigger than that. Something probably on the scale of the whole head of the deer. Another nice example. This is from Levin's own work. Uh, you see a planarian there with the head and the tail and the body in the middle. You know from probably high school biology, you can cut these things up and they each piece regenerates, which is just cool as all hell if you ask me. What he did is take a bunch of these things, or let's say take one of them and cut off the head and the tail. And if that was all he did, it would regrow a tail and it would regrow a head and it would look like the original. But that's not all he did. He introduced a chemical perturbation that cuts the lines of communication between head and tail. I don't know to me. Um, but the end result was that a new organism was regrown with two heads. Okay, fair enough, accidents happen. He took the same organism and cut off the head and the head this time again, and let it regenerate. And it regenerated a head and a head. And you can keep doing this, keep cutting off the two heads and it keeps regenerating the head and the head. There's been no genetic change here. It's the same animal, it's the same genome, but something is remembering the perturbation, something organism scale is remembering the perturbation. He's calling it a field, I'm calling it a field. Um, and directing those tissues um, to reproduce heads. Okay, <clears throat> ah, adaptation. I'm arguing that adaptation is the control of a lineage control. Sorry, I shouldn't use that word. It's the direction of a lineage 
by an ecological field. All right, down to specifics. Ancient turtles back in the Mesozoic could not fold their necks. Their heads just stuck out of a shell, inviting a predator to bite it off. Um, sometime in the past hundred million years, um, turtles have evolved neck folding, the ability to hold What you're looking at here is a trend in phenotype. The two axes are phenotype. Ancient non-neck folding turtles down in the lower left, modern neck folding turtles in the upper right. There's an evolutionary trajectory. It's an adaptation. It's been demonstrated to be an adaptation. Those blue arrows, is it a field? It's an ecological field consisting of many different features, but let's focus on the predators. They are, they are present throughout the whole evolutionary trajectory. The trajectory is not straight. There's a lot of wandering here. Um, other adaptations pull the neck folding mechanism in another direction. The turtle's got to raise its head as well as fold it. That produces complications. It's not a straight line from non-neck folding to neck folding. But there's the predator field all the time, nudging it towards neck folding um, in the case of these turtles. Uh, the other collections of arrows, by the way, the ones at the top, the five arrows at the top and the five arrows on the lower right are just recognition that there's other selective pressures at work here, dragging the thing in other directions. It need not have evolved neck folding. You could have instead lost the shell and developed great speed. We could have turtles that can run like cheetahs. What the hell, maybe unlikely. Um, but there are other selection pressures. The, pressure to, the predator pressure towards neck folding is just one, which in actuality triumphed um, and gave them neck folding. Story is actually somewhat more interesting than that because it happened twice independently in two different groups of turtles. And that's why I picked this example. It's a case of iterative evolution. Uh, there's two modern groups, the cryptodires and the pleurodires. And what you see on the right is, is inside view, a cryptodire neck and the folding pattern between the fifth and sixth neck vertebra, there's a fold. And then between the eighth neck vertebra and the first dorsal, there's a fold. It's folding in the vertical plane. Pleurodires, on the other hand, and now you're looking at a down view, <clears throat> fold between vertebrae two and three and between five and six. It's folding in the horizontal plane. It's a whole different way to do neck folding. And they arrived at it independently <clears throat> two, two lineages introduced into an ecological field containing predators follow trajectories toward neck folding, um, <clears throat> which were not necessary with lots of uh, deviations. And it's a, I, I think of it as a case of persistence and plasticity. They're, they have the same starting point, uh, but it's like bacteria swimming up a food gradient in their persistence and plasticity and field drivenness. That's not a word, but it is now. Okay, we're getting towards nine o'clock. Um, so I will come back in questions and answers to, sorry, nine o'clock my time, God, look, three in the afternoon. You people should be ready for beer at this point, right? Uh, I see smiles. Okay, yes, you are. <laughs> All right, so I'll help get you there. I will skip talking about affective and non-affective processes and how wanting, preferring, intending is a field theoretic view. Um, it's all based on Hume's notion, which separates past passion and reason. And I will certainly come back to it if anybody wants to talk about it in questions and answers. Okay, some topics for discussion. You probably got your own, but let me just throw um, at you uh, five or six or seven or eight that I've thought of that you might want to raise. Um, I've said, and I, I want to reemphasize, I'm not defining goal directedness. Like, um, like Nagel and Summerhoff were, I'm giving no formal definition of goal directedness. I'm just explaining it, which sounds weird that I know, I know, but I don't think we're ready to come up with a definition of goal directedness. I don't think we know enough about it yet. Second, I want to argue goal directedness comes in degrees, a ball rolling around in a bowl headed for the bottom of the bowl. Do I really want to call that goal directed? Yes, to a, to a degree, I do not as goal directed as um, me wanting to go to the bakery and get a, get a loaf of bread, um, not as complexly goal directed, but goal directed nonetheless. I think we have to do this. Otherwise we're stuck with the following puzzle. If we limit it to life, if we limit goal directedness to things that living organisms do, then in the transition from non-life to life, which we know for a fact happened, 
uh, we get the sudden emergence out of no, nothing, full blown, we get goal directedness. Non life, no goal directedness by definition, perhaps life having the potential for goal directedness, and it just emerges from nothing. We don't want that. We want it to come in degrees. We want to be able to give some degree of goal directedness to chemical systems that gave rise to life. Uh, third topic for discussion is this unification uh, that I'm offering them all the different uh, examples of goal directedness, all the different categories. <clears throat> Another thing we could talk about, um, I don't know if uh, Francis Hayline is in the room. Um, uh, ah, there you are. Okay, right. Sorry, you were there originally. You're still there. Um, <clears throat> I think our views are very similar. I think your view has um, uh, virtual entities moving within a state space. Mine has physical entities moving within a real space. I think you have a more inclusive notion of goal directedness. You want to include notions of agency in it. I think that's fine. Um, I'm going for a pared down, a stripped down version of goal directedness in which you could add agency later. And I have things to say about agency um, and more about freedom um, if we want to raise it. Um, here, let me just say that this is emphatically not an Aristotelian view. Field theory is externalist. The guiding force, the guiding factor is an external field. Aristotle's view was internalist. The guidance was provided somehow, he didn't know how, um, inside goal directed entities. And it's not a cybernetic view, which I mentioned before. Here, I just wanted to show you a typical cybernetic diagram for you know, an amplifier or a thermostat or something like that. There's no hierarchy, there's no nestedness. And I don't think you can get goal directedness without the nestedness, not even in the case of the thermostat, but we can talk about that. Um, <clears throat> also, another thing we could talk about is I actually have no role for goals in goal directedness. If I could change the name of goal directedness, I would, because goals just don't matter. If you could have the food field without the, the peanut butter sandwich, it would work just as well. We'd have a trajectory going up the food gradient. Goals do not figure in um, goal directedness. Um, goal direct, my field theory leads to a notion of function that we can talk about, about the relationship between goal directedness and function. It leads to a notion of goal directedness and agency, which I can fumble around and try and say something intelligent about. I might fail. Um, and then I just want to add this sort of teaser. Uh, the puzzle of goal directedness is classically conceived as a puzzle in time seeming backward causation, the future causing the past, but it's actually the solution to goal directedness is space. It's something that happens spatially, not in time, spatially as in the field. And let me stop there. All right, so, so we have one hour for, for the discussions. Maybe we'll just rearrange a little bit the, uh, uh, the screen and I suggest that if you can uh, uh, people online please put your cameras on it will be it will be uh, nice to, to see if when, when we are discussing and who wants to speak just you know like just signal down and, I'm gonna stop sharing so I can see people so now, now we see you <laughs> so who wants to start <laughs> yeah, of course, I have a lot of things to say about that. I know your theory already for a while. I just recently reviewed a related paper of yours. It was supposedly double blind, but it was easy to guess who had written it. So it did give all these same arguments. And I think one of the points you made at the end was the point I would also make that this is not a theory about goal directedness, it's a theory about directedness. So, yes. In that sense, it is maybe too broad because the field concept is a concept that comes from physics and it is intended precisely to show how things are directed when they move. An electromagnetic field, for example, will determine how a charged particle will move. A gravitational field will determine how a massive object moves. And then these derived notions like fields, morphogenetic fields, it's the same principle. What you have is a space in which there is some differentiation so that some, some parts of the space have more of it and others less of it, and that gives a direction. 
the, the classical idea in physics is the idea you have a potential function that means a, a function that is higher in some place, places in space, lower in some, and then you have a gradient that goes up or down the potential doesn't matter, but it gives a direction. And that directionality typically is how in physics you uh, define the notion of force. A force is a derivative of the uh, potential energy. And that is actually where all these theories come from. But given that, then the question is, what does this add to the purely physical notion of a force field? So maybe that will be my first question. What does this add to the physical notion that has something to do with goals? Yeah, it has nothing to do with goals, but, but it accounts for all goal-directed systems. It accounts for their behavior. And I'm arguing that goal-directedness is really very simple. And, and as you point out, already solved problem. It's not a big deal. Um, and if we, we just have to think about it in field terms. The one place where I think we differ, differ is um, you describe fields as a function. And I don't think of them as, as mathematical concepts, as mathematical constructions of any kind. I think of them as purely physical. So if we're talking about an electromagnetic field, I'm talking about the function that describes the behavior They're talking about the curvature of space or gravitons or something like that but whatever it is it's physical so um yeah let me stop there because you you yeah, look yeah. like you're ready to pounce I, I am i am a physicist and that is why i know that what others call physical actually is something much more abstract and much more mathematical than people imagine I mean, physics, after all, is a mathematical theory to describe certain dynamics as observed in the world. And uh, especially theories like quantum mechanics show that you can't really say that the electron is a particle or even that it's a wave. It is really more a probability distribution, which itself is a mathematical concept. So the notion between physical and mathematical for a real physicist, that's not at all obvious. And then that brings me to the, the second question I had, that is that you assume that a field first needs to be physical and second needs to be external. But I can imagine goal-directed activities where there is no movement in any external physical space. For example, maybe I'm thinking about the problem and I have a goal of solving that problem. And while thinking I solve it, and I haven't interacted with anything outside my own mind. How would that fit in your theory? I suppose you would say yes, but there is some kind of a field of elect of neurons. But then you yes. said the neurons interacting, it's lateral direction, it's not it's not upper direction. So we're venturing into tricky territory here because so little is known about what a thought is or a motivation is. Um, to, to your first remark about the physics for a moment, I'm not a physicist, you are, um, but I can say this, from a human perspective, where we're talking about just causes, you don't need any mathematics to talk about the causality involved with fields. You, you, Hume could have described the movement of a ball to the bottom of a bowl in field theoretic terms without knowing anything about the mathematics of how it did it. If he'd never read Newton, he could have done it. Um, <clears throat> so now coming back to your idea of motion not being necessary, there is motion in the example that you gave and you actually sort of answered the question yourself. There's neural motion, neural activity, and it doesn't have to be act Actual physical movement in space. Well, most of my examples were physical movement in space, but it, it doesn't have to be like that. The activity of the entities contained within the field has to be directed. And that activity could take the form of genes being turned on and off, neurons being activated, that sort of thing. So if I'd lingered on that, on that last slide about wanting, preferring, caring, the argument would have been that wanting your desire to um, solve some pro problem to get to a goal is the field, the desire is the field, and the entity is whatever package of neurons is involved in the thinking uh, that's 
kind of help you solve the problem. So there is there's always movement. There may not be physical movement in space. Uh, actually, at the level of molecules, there is always physical movement in space, even within the thinking case. But there, you don't have to be on a trajectory out in the world towards a sandwich or something like that uh, for it to be. I didn't mean to imply with my example that they have to be like that. There has to be some activity that's governed, that's directed by the field. That's all. Please tell me in what way you're unsatisfied. <laughs> you look very unsatisfied. Well, I'll give you my other example, uh, the famous thermostat, the simplest form of a cybernetic system. What does a thermostat do? It senses a temperature, and the only thing it knows is the temperature is high enough, or it's not yeah. high enough. It's not high yep. enough, it's on the heating. If it's high enough, it switches off the heating. Where is the field there outside the thermostat? Uh -huh. Yes. So here, here's what the cybernetic view misses. The field is the house. The field is the walls and the ceiling and the floor of the house, because without them, there is no field and the thermostat doesn't work, right? So the physical component of it in that case, and I think in all the cybernetic cases, is, is the physical structure. This is coming out of Herbert Simon who was reacting against the cybernetic view in claiming that things like physical proximity and shared boundaries and so on are absolutely critical in determining uh, the structure, the way systems are structured and the way in which they behave. So this says the thermostat example, it's a nice technical representation if you wanna put all the action in the thermostat, but you're leaving out the field without which nothing happens. Well, it's a little bit a question of what do you consider most important? The way I would see it, and I think most people would see it, it's the thermostat is controlling the temperature of the room. Yeah. So yeah. It is controlling yeah. the thermostat because it's a thermostat that is programmed in a particular way to lead the room to a particular temperature, and the room does not know what that temperature is. The room can only give back, like it tells the thermostat, yes, you did it in your goal, or no, you're not there yet. The room is being controlled by the cut out there. I don't know if that was sorry, your voice cut out. That could be on my end. Let me try and move to somewhere else. But I think I know what you were saying. The therm thermostat's doing all the work. It's where the action is. It's um, action, but the thermostat is the one that chooses the goal, depending on the programming of the thermostat. Sure. To 20 degrees or to 40 degrees. Yeah. The room is just passive. The room is being regulated by the thermostat. The thermostat decides what the goal is. So you can't really say that it's the, yep. the room that is directing the thermostat. The room is giving yeah, I, back to the thermostat. That's not the same thing. So two comments on that. What room? In the cybernetic depiction of this, there is no room. There's just a feedback mechanism. And I yeah. want to put the emphasis on the room, room without which there's no direction. Thermostat can't do a damn thing if there's no room, right? Also, the bacterium. Everybody wants to focus on the mechanism within the bacterium, and that's fine. That's a really interesting mechanism. But that mechanism by itself can't do a damn thing. It needs that boring passive field out there. Well, that boring passive field is doing an enormous amount of work in this system. It's making it goal directed. Right? And I'm arguing that the house is making the thermostat goal directed in a way that it couldn't possibly. Yes, there's a set point within the thermostat. Yes, there's a set point within the bacterium in those fancy mechanisms within the bacterium. But set points don't drive behavior. Right? I uh, know. I, I think it's the set point that does drive the behavior. No, uh, well, I, I disagree. Uh, let, let, me give you, let me give you another criticism. You say it's the field that's doing all the work. But the question is, what field? If I look at no. the world surrounded by 100 million different fields, most of which I don't care, at yep. all, fields of X-rays and of radioactivity and of molecules of this yep. type, molecules of that type, and I right. don't care at all what they are. It's just that when I am close to the bakery, there's a particular yep. thing, which, because in my mind, I have yep. the goal of eating, and that goal has been built yep. in my body that I react to the smell of the of the bread. It's not a, it's not it's not the field. There are these hundred million of other fields that I just don't care about. 
in the case of the bacterium, it too is immersed in multiple fields, like the sunlight field and the gravity field. And like you, it doesn't care about most of the fields that, are, that, that it's immersed in. It, it's built in such a way that it only cares about one, which is the food gradient, right? And you too are built in such a way that you only care about certain other, a small fraction of the gradients within which you're immersed, right? But where is the information for that one thing that you care about? Where is the information about where to go and what to do coming from? And I'm saying that absent the refrigerator where your food is, absent the walls of the room, the floor of the room that holds the refrigerator, the whole field that sets up the problem for you, absent all that, you don't know where to go any more than the bacteria where to go. there's no food field. But I'm not denying- Wander around hungry and random. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not denying that the food plays that the field plays an in, 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 in important role because goal directedness implies that you're not sure exactly where the goal is. Otherwise, you would already be there. It means you need some information. You need some feedback. Yes. So the signal that tells you yes, you're on the right way or no. Uh, yes. You're being disturbed. But that one bit of information, I think it's much less important than the whole machinery of the control so, inside my own mind that decides which little bit of information I need to pluck out of these 100 million fields. Right. So you use the word important, and that's relative, relative to what you're interested in. If I were to raise the, the food field and the bacterium and a bunch of molecular biologists or physiologists, they would say, yeah, yeah, the food field, it's not important. What matters is that fancy mechanism inside, which is doing all the, all the work. That's what evolved by natural selection. That's the most, in, that's where the decisions are being made, right? To which I say they're decisions that would be in a vacuum without the food field, because without the food field, there is zero direction. I mean, the mechanism will sit there deciding up a storm as you would sit there deciding up a storm. I want this food, I want that food, but no actual goal-directed behavior results unless there's a field in which you're immersed that says the fridge is over here. The pastries they set up for the seminar are over there. The beer is over, all these, all these fields that you care about and you have to care just like the bacterium has to care about aspartate, right? If it doesn't care, it doesn't see the aspartate and right, if you don't see any food, if you're not hungry, you don't see the various fields that you're immersed in. So I think the only extreme statement I'm making, I'm not saying mechanism doesn't matter. It's hugely interesting. It's hugely important. I'm just saying all the direction, all the information about where to go, all the information that tells the goal-directed entity what to do is in the field. It can't be anywhere else. Yeah, but that's exactly what cybernetics says, except that cybernetics calls it feedback. The feedback is the signal you get from the environment that tells you in how far you are right. closer or farther away. You can call it feedback or you can call it a field. Of course, it is essential. But the, I think the most important point is which signals yeah. out of these 100 million possible signals that are around in all these possible fields around it, do you pay attention sure. to that it depends on the internal uh, organization. Sure. Yes, sure. That's when you say important, I agree. Important, very important, because otherwise you wouldn't do anything. But having decided that you're interested in food, let's say, now what do you do <laughs> if there's no field? You sit there and starve, right? Or you wander around randomly, and who knows, maybe you'll get lucky. Um, <clears throat> But I'm not downplaying the importance of the mechanism. I, I, those mechanisms, are, I want to know how sea turtles do it. Right? <laughs> what, what goes on in their heads that enables them to follow a magnetic field as opposed to all the other damn fields that they're immersed in, they picked out that one, right? And at other times of their life, they're not interested in the magnetic field, they're interested in some other field. And that changes from time. And they make decisions that affect which field they're interested. Everything you said is dead on. I'm just saying when, a decision has been made. I'm interested in the magnetic field. All the information about where to go comes from that field. That's all I'm saying. Uh, we have somebody. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't see your name now. Uh, you mean me? Yes, 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 yes. Sorry. Okay, yeah. 
Uh, you all I don't see your name anymore. So, yeah. Don't worry, that's fine. Yeah, thank you, Dan, for this talk. Um, I know that paper, the <laughs> similar <laughs> construction as um, Francis does, as you know. Um, yes. So I would like to come back to the question of what the field is. Um, I was mm -hmm. wondering, the way you were talking about it, it sounded to me as if you were just using that term and the same meaning as other people would use the term environment or would talk about affordances in an environment or you could take the German term Umwelt, where it is implied that each organism, because of its specific needs, um, if we talk about living systems, um, perceives the, the environment in a particular way, namely that way that matches with its um, basic needs. Yes. So, so what do we actually gain uh, from using that different term, talking about fields? And to make it more specific, I feel like, um, you emphasize the extrinsic guidance that is provided by the field. And at the same time, you say, oh, well, but the internal mechanisms are also really important. <laughs> uh, so why is it so so um, important to you to emphasize the extrinsic um, guidance rather than, for example, talking about interaction? Then, because surely right. there, I mean, what is the internal mechanism an organism has for? Well, um, that has to do with uh, that this organism needs to survive in a particular environment. So, and of course, these internal mechanisms, they are um, directed towards the environment in themselves, right? So there yeah. needs to be this interaction, this sort of horizon um, yeah. that just, you know, opens up due to, well, this particular perspective that the organism brings with it. So I'm, I'm not sure why, I mean, is it just because you are, um, you don't like Aristotle and you think as soon as one talks about internal, um, I don't know, needs or purposes, then we're talking about essences. I don't think that this is necessary. Um, you could just have a much more primitive idea at something like attraction and repulsion or something, and you don't need any essences for that, especially not if you argue from a more processual background as I like to do. So you raised at least two questions and maybe 13, depending on how you parse it. And I can only remember one at a time. So let me start with number one and then I'll come back to you and you, you, you'll remind me what number two was. That's fine, just go ahead. Num number one is what's the point of using the word field when we could just use environment? Uh, we could just use environment, but this is a, what's the word for it? A deflationary account of goal directedness. And field provides a nice link to some really boring, simple physical systems like the ball, ball in the bowl in a gravity field and the electric particle in an electric field. And the implication of making that connection is goal directness really isn't very complicated. All right. The environment, everybody thinks of environments as comp complex and for organisms evolving and behaving, they are complex. And I want those to be included, definitely. I don't, but I don't want to use the word environment. I want to use something much more simple-minded that evokes something more simple. Um, that's part one of the answer to that part of your question. The other part is that uh, Gunnar Babcock and I are working on a paper on fields at this moment, and I don't really know what a field is. <laughs> catch, catch me in a month. Um, but, but the connections you're looking for, hopefully we'll have something intelligent to say about. Uh, right now we're the whole uh, basis of the argument is the long list of examples of goal directedness. And we're trying to find common threads among all of them that will point us in the direction of what a field was in such a way that it encompasses the ball in the bowl and the organism making complicated decisions in an environment and so on. But your original intuition that it's just environment, yeah, with all the right footnotes, I could go along with that. It'd be a lot of footnotes. Okay, what was number two had to do with, I, I forgot. When and intrinsic. Um, yeah. Rather than interaction and just acknowledging that there needs to be both. There needs to be both, except I want to, I'm going to sound like a broken record here. Um, <clears throat> I want to drive home the point that the external stuff is not just background stuff. Yeah, thermostat and the walls of the house, whatever, you know? No, the walls of the house. I wanna say it in a different tone of voice. Uh, the bacterium in the food field, you know, the food field. No, the food field, that's what's telling, it, providing all the information. 
So I want a heavy emphasis. I want an exclamation point and bold and underlining for this piece of the action without denigrating the internal stuff. And that's what I was trying to do, mm -hmm. Francis, in, in talking to you about this. I don't want to say it's not important. I, I, it comes out that way, I know sometimes. But, I, but so little emphasis has been placed on the role of the field and its role is so central to goal-directedness working. Really, nothing happens without the field. The self-driving car doesn't go any anywhere, or if it goes, it smashes into things. <laughs> um, so it's tactical, it's rhetorical. That's not a very interesting answer, I know, from a philosophical point of view. Um, but how we understand these these things has to do with these tactics. So I want to just put emphasis on the on the external component. Okay, I mean, I can see why you do that because you're after this deflationary account. And you yeah. want to have an overarching narrative that fits it all in, like the non-living yeah. and the living. Yep. Um, but there was Francis's point. Um, I mean, there could be a difference between directedness and goal directedness because you might wonder what are the goals and where do they come from yeah. in the non-living cases. And as long as we talk about artifacts, for example, also yeah. the torpedo, for example, uh, I mean, you could wonder, okay, there is somebody who sets up a goal and then this is just like realized by this uh, machine. Yeah. And so, so in that the, case, yeah. the, the goal is extrinsic, but it comes from a mind, right? And this yeah. is different from the case with the helium molecule, for example. So I was wondering, so you said something along the lines, well, the upper fields so from the perspective of the, the field, the movements of the helium atom uh, molecule, they look like arrows. Um, but I don't get that because there can only be an error if there's a real goal. And I don't know where the goal comes from in oh. that particular case. Um, oh, it should thank, be a very notion yeah. of, a, of a goal, which I simply don't get, right? And yeah. so you said, well, we need to have that somehow in the picture because otherwise the, uh, there would be a leap uh, from the non-living to the living. Yeah. Um, I mean, but maybe talking about ontology, maybe this is just how it is. <laughs> I mean, this is not really an argument. Um, yeah. Luckily, I've got a quick and ready answer that you won't find satisfactory. Hang on, I can't believe I allowed my phone to ring. Okay, um, I've got a quick and ready answer to this, which you probably won't like, but um, <clears throat> I got rid of goals. You remember in the 17th slide, no such thing as goals and I don't need them. And if I had to define goal directedness, if somebody, tied me to, <laughs> tied me down in a chair and said, you're not leaving until you define goal directedness. It would take the form of something like persistence and plasticity towards a trajectory, mm -hmm. not towards a goal. Yeah. Because after all, the, the particle, the, the entity is immersed in the field and the interaction between the field and the particle is local. Particle doesn't know what's going on three feet away from it. It only knows what's going on right at its boundary. It's, that's where it sees the field, right? There's no goal in its, in its universe. It, the only decision that's being made is, am I gonna go north or northwest in response to the field right around me? And that's a trajectory that we're talking about, not a goal. So if I could purge the word goal from the whole discussion of goal directedness, which I cannot do, nobody would allow me to do that without inventing new words and that's a dead end. Um, I would do that because goals just don't matter. What matters is trajectories. Now, you also raised the problem of people having goals or the person launching the torpedo having a goal. The tor torpedo, I should not even include this in my talk because it's such a messy system. We've got layers of goal directedness. There's the goal directedness of the machine pursuing the sound field, indifferent to the target ship, who would just as soon follow the pod of whales as follow the target ship, it doesn't care. The person that launched the torpedo did have an idea. He did have a, a picture in his head or, or her head of what the torpedo should do. That, that's different from the goal directedness of the torpedo. The person who designed the torpedo had an idea in his or her head of what the mechanism was supposed to do. So there are layers of goal directedness built into this technological system. So there isn't going to be, I think we have to dissect apart those different layers before we can talk about, uh, even talk about fields and entities and trajectories and so on. In the head of the captain of the submarine, let's say, 
he or she has a picture of the torpedo, imagining the torpedo following this wiggly trajectory toward the target ship. And that's the goal, right, in the person's mind. And looking at the sonar uh, in front of her, she, uh, she says, well, it's following it, sort of. The goal is being realized. Well, really, it isn't being realized. Um, and as the torpedo makes its way from, toward the target ship, in her mind, it's really complicated. This is a noisy example. I should not use it. In her mind, the trajectory is changing. She's nudging it a little to the left. No, go a little to the right. God, don't follow those whales. <laughs> right? um, so she doesn't have one goal in mind either. It's shifting. She has a trajectory in mind. Right? So again, I don't think anybody ever has a goal in mind. They have a trajectory in mind. Um, and that trajectory is dynamic. It's changing with time, as are the thoughts and behaviors that follow that are being guided along that trajectory. So I'm um, worried is there that hope enough. for the helium uh, molecules as well? Does it no, make decisions? It, no, it, you said it makes decisions. This well, sounds metaphorical to me. <laughs> I also said, don't be misled by my anthropomorphic language. So shame on you for not paying attention to that. Um, no, the helium atom isn't making decisions. It's easy to talk about it as though it is. But of course, yeah. it's a boringly simple goal-directed system with one layer of hierarchy. You couldn't get something less interestingly goal-directed than that, <laughs> except maybe the ball in the bowl, <laughs> yeah. which doesn't even do a random walk. So I see More. there's another question. So I step back for a moment. Okay. I might come back. <laughs> You, I, you might, there's no telling. I have more <laughs> questions. I bet you do. Antonella, yes? Yes, thank you. Um, Hayden, thank you for uh, the presentation. Yeah. Um, I ha also have a field-related re question. Um, mm -hmm. I'm kind of struggling uh, to reconciliate um, well, what you just said about field and about um, with uh, some specific example. And I would like to ask you first, have you ever heard of uh, the game of life? Yes, I have. All right. Yeah. Uh, I'm kind of thinking about uh, this uh, very well math mathematical uh, example yep. um, in which the structures emerge and even uh, moving structures. And uh, it seems that they are um, directed by uh, their interactions uh, within the entities. But I kind of, in that precise example, don't see how the field would uh, direct uh, the, um, like the cells. Uh, it's a good question. And I haven't thought about this particular one, but I thought generically about this sort of thing. My first answer, and a different one may emerge as we talk, All is right. that there is no field. That there's nothing goal-directed about the game of life. It's purely lateral interactions. It's like a pool table full of pool balls and somebody smashes open the triangle and they go scattering every which way. And they form interesting patterns sometimes if you look down on like constellation of stars in the sky and we marvel at them and go, isn't that interesting? But I don't see any goal directedness. I don't see any trajectory directedness here. Uh, yeah, I understand uh, what you say, but I have some a point that, uh, well, an argument that will sure. at least uh, bring some questions is that when you launch a simulation of uh, the game of life in random, even where well, it's completely random, but you see certain structures emerge and yes. you can launch it like a thousand, 10,000 times and there you will always see like some typical structures. So it seems yeah. like that would be some directive that does that's not just some, yeah. some uh, balls that are thrown away and they go everywhere. It yeah. emerge even though everything is wrong right. at the beginning. So the notion of emergence is not in my field of view, but something you said is in my field of view, right. which is the repeatability of it. Yeah. And if it ter turns out that the same structures emerge again and again, it sounds like they're one of Francis's attractors out there which I want to nod my head agreeably to, say, yeah, there's attractors out there. I just want to add that they're physical. That all, that's all. That they're represented somehow in the, in the uh, digital setup of, of the machine that you've got going. 
And yeah, there's going to be an electric field. The thing, the machine plugs into the wall, right? The laptop plugs into the wall. And so that we know that at a minimum, there's an electric field. There may be higher level structures within that. I don't understand uh, computer programming well enough to say, but if you've got repeatability, if you've got the same, if you've got different initial conditions giving rise reliably to the same outcome, that sure smells of persistence and plasticity. Let's go looking for fields. And I'm not enough, you want to know what the fields are. My answer is going to be, I don't know what they are. In the case of ecology and evolution, I know what they are. I don't know how to say it in the term in terms of um, most electronic devices, except to say, let's not ignore the electric field. When you plug it into the wall, you're creating a potential difference that's driving electrons this way and that. With a complex internal structure, like the complex internal structure of a bacterium, right, producing these patterns of behavior that are interestingly persistent and plastic. The only part I don't understand is what the intermediate structures built into the programming might be, because it's not as simple as the electric field. Mm -hmm. That's a really unsatisfactory answer. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess uh, I, I guess I, I will be thinking about it a little bit more, but uh, yeah, uh, I feel it's like uh, maybe an example that doesn't apply, though, because it, yeah. One of the reasons I shy away from defining goal directedness is because I haven't thought of all of the examples and I can't prove that all goal directed systems do this. Yeah. What's more, along with my co author, Gunnar Babcock, lately, we've been trying to think of how could you get goal directedness without any sort of field at all? And here's the sort of thing this might be helpful to. Here's the sort of thing we come up with let's have a self driving car in which you have programmed into it, loaded into its onboard memory and decision-making capacity, every possible route from start to finish for a trip, mm -hmm. every possible route and decision-making apparatus to pick among them. What's more, you've programmed into it every possible perturbation that it could run into. That pothole the car ran over, we got that programmed in. We knew the pothole was there, right? right. The pedestrian walking in front of the car, we, we knew that was going to happen. That's, you could have a vast memory that included all possible perturbations, mm -hmm. and the system would just grind through mechanically, and you would get to the destination, perturbations and all. These systems are wildly brittle. Something happens, anything happens that, that you didn't foresee, that wasn't built into the programming, and you're screwed. The thing isn't, the car isn't going to make it to its destination, right? The beauty of field theory is it says, you don't have to know all that. You don't have, have to program any of that. This is really an, an engineering approach to goal directedness, not a philosophical one. It says, look, if you're trying to engineer goal directedness, fields are the way to go. Everything else is crazy and it's going to be brittle. And there are going to be many circumstances where it doesn't work. If you want it to work, make it hierarchical, uh, use field theory. Uh, um, from what you said, uh, yeah, it gave me an idea. It feels yeah. like um, uh, whether the well, the, the importance of the field could be um, determined by whether the goal is dependent on the field or whether it's only dependent on the items it themselves. Like uh, huh. in the game of life, the is the existence yeah. of the structure that is uh, the goal, and it's yeah. not dependent on the field and and in, in the other example of the car, it's uh, driving through uh, an yeah. environment so that it would become dependent on the field. Right. Tell me if this is parallel or not. Um, in the case of genes controlling development, they don't really, but let's talk as though they do. Right. Um, development of, of an organism. Um, <clears throat> they are producing the substances that produce the field that guide the organism, right? So. That's a case of the goal, so to speak, coming from the little pieces within, like in your game of life. Yeah, yeah. Except it's not, <laughs> right? Because, and I suspect life is like the game of life is like this too. But I can't prove it because I don't understand computers well enough. I don't understand the programming for that game well enough. Um, but I know in the case of, of a developing organism, how that field arises is a matter of utter indifference to the cells within it. So it could be they secrete some gene product which forms a field and tells them what to do next, 
or the experimenter could inject bicoid <laughs> along some gradient, right? And get, the, and get them to do something else. It doesn't care where the field comes from. And in fact, in the Drosophila embryo, the field initially comes from mom, from something big outside of them. It doesn't make any difference to them. What matters is that the field is the right scale, which is huge from their perspective, um, and that it directs them uh, when, perturbations are, when perturbations arise. So you raise the issue, and I think it's a good one, between where the whole process originates. Is yeah. it in the little things, or is it at some higher level, higher level scale? And if all you mean by origination is providing the, the materials to, that will produce the field, then it doesn't matter. Right. But what it, troubles me in um, the example you just uh, uh, gave is yeah. that um, the like what the genes produce, yeah. uh, it's part of the organism. It, it's not like something else in which it nope. evolves. And it's part of, it's of part the, the organisms and what it's going to become. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, can you really can you really call that a field, even though it's part of the organism? Um, in the case of pattern of segmentation of Drosophila, it's the whole organism. The field extends from one end to the other, so it's as big as you can get and still be part of the organism. Um, <clears throat> but yes. Provided the guided entity is inside the field, scale doesn't matter, inside outside doesn't matter. So I have to, to claim in order to defend my view, I have to claim that the guided entities, the cells, their genes are always smaller than and inside of the field. The field may be within the organism, as you said, but that doesn't matter. They're bigger than it. So we have a tendency to think of organisms as having a master plan for I'm gonna become an adult oak tree and there's a plan for oak tree in there. There isn't a plan for oak tree in there. There's a plan, so to speak, a field for branches. There's a field, a smaller field for leaves. And inside each one of these is a bunch of cells taking their direction from these fields. So no master plan, but lots of fields, some of them very large, some of them organism scale in, in size. There's a great problem that's come up in, it actually is decades old in developmental biology. How does your right arm and left arm, how do they end up the same length, all right? If it was purely local control with each arm doing its own thing, cells within each arm dividing at some preset pace, right? Errors would be made, errors happen all the time in development. They'd end up different lengths typically. They don't. Well, there's always differences, right? But within very narrow tolerances, they end up at, at nearly the same length. There has to be some organism scale field that's telling both of them <laughs> to stay the same length. It knows things that each individual arm doesn't know. We don't know what that field is. That makes it a terrible example for demonstrating anything. But it raises the question, it raises interesting scientific questions, where to look for fields. Well, we need something organism scale in the case of left and right arm, or at least top half of body scale um, in terms of, and that's what we needed in the case of the planarian and Levin's case. That's what we need in the case of the uh, deer antlers. We need things that are big relative to the entities that they're controlling. They can be, coming back to your question, they can be entirely within the boundaries, the skin of the organism. And that's fine. I have no problem with that. If I may comment on the on the game of life example, it's a it's a brilliant example for actually a very nicely goal oriented system. If you look around and see the external frame, because the, what this the system is is a is a program selected from all the possible configurations of uh. algorithms that it will look like life. Yeah. <laughs> all, all the combinations of algorithms that didn't produce this result didn't get into the, the, the setup. Yeah? So yeah, right. It's an ecology, it's an ecology that it evolved in. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there is there, like this is this is obviously like within the like a like a guiding, you know, like setup yeah. of selecting, making a uh, selection yeah. making. Uh, yeah. Th thank you, Marta. That, that's the answer I should have given. Sorry about that. <laughs> the answer I should have given was that it's just like development. 
um, there was an ecology among computer programmers <laughs> that produced this set of genes, so to speak, this rule set for the, for the game of life. Um, and when you play it over and over again, it produces the same results. Um, that's like development playing itself over and over again, producing the same results. Acorns producing oak trees over and over and over again, right? With the actual guidance, local guidance due to internal fields. And that's the part where I'm still fuzzy and will remain fuzzy for a long time. Within the computer itself, it's doing one instance of the game of life. What's the field structure? And I don't know the answer to that. But you're right about the big external ecology guiding the whole um, programming itself. These are fun for me. Go ahead. Uh, Anna, yes. And Sophie, sorry. Yeah, so I think. Um... You're back. <laughs> I, think, I, I see the beauty of um, using the term field in the case of development because I mean that is Michael Levin's work uh, how he yep. shows that it's bioelectrical patterns of fields that are somehow inherited uh, that guide the, the sort of that is the means of communication between the cells and guides them their, their yep. individual actions so surely this this looks field like, yep. uh, but of course, from the point of the view of the individual cells, this is also just their environment, right? Yep. So the environment is the, the whole organism, developing organism, and yep. there is communication interaction going yep. on between these uh, cells. Yep. And this is how the, the organism comes about. I think there are yep. different ways of, yeah, maybe, you know, putting in words the same <laughs> thing, no, you, you... but slightly different emphasis on, on, on the aspects of it. Yes, it's very perspective dependent. And the perspective I'm taking is top down. I'm looking down on the system and asking what's mm -hmm. doing the work here. And from the entity's perspective, it looks like lateral interactions like mm -hmm. crazy, <laughs> All right? Um, where's the field? Oh, there's the skin of the balloon, whatever. I don't see it very often, <laughs> All right? It can't matter much in where I go. And from the perspective of the individual cells, yeah, most of the time, most of the day, as the clock ticks around the field doesn't matter, but at critical moments it does, right? I also take the point, um, and I, but I think I've, I interpret it slightly differently. <laughs> uh, yeah. A system that would be hardwired for every possible single bite of yeah. or possibility or whatever would be brittle. And I mean, that's where uh, surely life um, was very successful in avoiding that. I mean, this is, Somehow, where I would that's that's what I would describe as sort of emancipation from pure um, sort of mechanistic uh, causation, where perception comes into the picture and the organism as an agent that makes yes. decision in the lights of possibilities, right? Oh, yes. these yes. decisions, of course, can go wrong, so there might yeah. be error, and yeah. there's a clear normativity standard there, and that is simply survival. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but. In the end, it's it's the safer mechanism, so to speak, to let the organism itself decide yes. rather than pre-programming it for every possible uh, yes. thing that might happen in the world. Now, yeah. still, in the way I describe it, there is a difference from the case of the self-driving car, even though I acknowledge that there is also a similarity. And I see that this is the beauty of your theory that we can sort of... Um, mm. Uh, become aware of those similarities, which we might have overlooked um, beforehand. But there is something, it's a different kind of causation in the self-driving car that is sort of guided and interacting with, with the field, the GPS mm. field. It doesn't make those decisions um, in the same way as an organism does, because there is a, a lack of that particular normativity. The car yeah. isn't concerned with its own survival. Right. And so it has, has a goal that has been set onto it for, um, from the outside. So it's clearly yeah. external, it's an artifact. And then there is a sort of leeway that's given to it by the algorithm. And of course, it also has sensors. So it, there is a very minimal um, uh, perception. I don't know whether I really want to call it, but awareness yeah, of, of environment, right? Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And still, so I think... I mean, I'm really fine with have in principle bringing out these these similarities between the non-living and the living, but at the same time, we should also 
um, stay um, sensible, um, aware of, of the differences. So the novelty yes. that comes with life. And that yes. has to do with a different type of causation there. So it's, I, it's really a departure from purely mechanistic causation. And this is what I'm missing a little bit in your picture. So let's go back to the self-driving car example. It's a nice one because there's two levels of goal directedness. There's the level provided by the GPS tower and then buried within the programming of the car is some goal directedness that's involved in avoiding pedestrians and stopping at traffic lights, none of mm -hmm. which the cell tower knows anything about. Yeah. <clears throat> so the self-driving car, and I don't want to compare it to a human being or, or an ape or anything like that or anything, any fancy organism, but we're down at the level of a bacterium, we're getting pretty close. It's got some fancy stuff going on within it, some fancy fields that enable it to perceive the pedestrian, make a decision about which way to go to avoid the pedestrian, right? None of which has anything to do with the overall route. And all of this local decision-making is contained within the car. That's the beauty of self-driving car. Actually, I shouldn't say the beauty of self-driving cars. This is a terrible invention. It's gonna kill a lot of people all for our convenience but never mind that the technology is kind of beautiful what the, what they've been able to do with it and they are sort of mim mimicking what you say organisms are able to do which is provide their own local goals and adopt trajectories that uh, that approach those goals and they do it without any prompting without much prompting it's never zero <laughs> from the outside environment uh, there, and I would use the word agency for that. Gunnar and I are developing a notion of agency, and it looks something like what you just described, where the fields arise within you and guide the, the smaller entities within you, and there's minimal dependence on the outside world. Never zero. Everybody's dependent on the outside world. Um, but to the extent you can become autonomous, the extent you can remove yourself from the influence of outside fields, become free of outside fields and be governed only by your own internal fields, that smacks of agency to me. I'm tempted, we're not ready to go there yet, but I'm tempted to use the word agency as you did um, in passing to, to describe that kind of capability. And I don't wanna draw the boundary, unlike you, I don't wanna draw the boundary at life, non-life. I think there's no reason non-life can't do this Grant you, the ball in the bowl doesn't even come close. <laughs> None of my physical examples, purely physical examples, even come close. They have very little autonomy, very little agency. They're mostly at the mercy of outside fields, right? But I don't want to rule it out in principle because I know the transition happened. We know we went from a out externally guided chemical system to an internally guided chemical system. And somewhere along that continuum, we want to draw a line and call it life, non-life. Well, I don't want to draw a line. And I don't want to draw a line for agency or for autonomy or for goal directedness either. Um, because the transition was gradual, I assume. It didn't mm -hmm. happen with a snap of the fingers. Yeah. Right? It needs to be a sharp there. line, but still, I think there's novelty. Well, I'm not sure <laughs> if you appreciate all the fuzziness out there. I'm in the middle of a hurricane right now. Mm -hmm. They have minimal agency. They have some. Um, it's a fairly complex system going on at an enormous scale going on outside here. They have a fair amount of autonomy. They're knocked this way and that by prevailing winds, by the westerlies in the case of the United States. Hurricanes are driven by the jet stream, which is totally predictable. That, that's why they can track hurricanes in advance. It's because the jet stream is predictable and its effect on the hurricane is predictable. And they are influenced by that. But there's a lot that they do that's internally driven. They spall off tornadoes at the edges. Who told them to do that? That's an internally generated fluid dynamical flow field that's, that's doing that. It's all them. Right? Um, <clears throat> always a case of some larger field within the hurricane directing some smaller yet field within the hurricane to produce these little edge tornadoes, which do enormous amounts of, of damage, sometimes often more than the hurricane itself. So I don't wanna say that a hurricane is an organism. I, I'm not willing to go that far, but we're somewhere in what I think is a big gray area between life and non-life with the hurricane being more toward the ball in the bowl, but more interesting than the ball in the bowl. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'll cut myself off there. Thank you.
It seems we have time for just one short final question and this will be time to, to finish. So Vishal, you are the next one. <laughs> Thank you, Marta. You've said one short question. So I thought I'd, I'll have a long <laughs> question. I'd keep it short now. <laughs> Well, they won't pay Thank attention you, to the clock, Vishal. We'll go over. <laughs> this, this is such a beautiful uh, topic, Dan. Thank you. Uh, uh, it's such an insightful uh, uh, subject. And thank you, School of Thinking, for selecting this topic. It, it's somehow my favorite topic, consciousness, <laughs> and how consciousness impacts how we live and how things work. Uh, it got me thinking about uh, free will and fate. So. If the field theory predetermines everything, then what is the role of free will and fate in it? That means everything is fated. I, I have been brought up in Hindu philosophy, being in India. So for me, uh, non-dualism comes naturally. You know, it's Vedantic philosophy. So, so I believe that there is energy in stone and there is energy in a human body and a tree. Uh, but I have been educationally brought up scientifically, so my rational mind obviously questions this. How is it possible? Uh, one question that I always wonder about is, uh, considering the theory of probabilities, it is possible that the first DNA could have been formed by a fluke. Uh, the first cell could have been formed by a fluke. Even one million cells could have been formed by fluke. But how come billions of human beings are being formed? Uh, billions of cells are replicating exactly in the manner they are. So it gets us to panpsychism and where science ends, we catch God. And, and do, do you feel then that we may be moving towards panpsychism a bit or talking about consciousness of physics, consciousness of biology, consciousness of maths. So we'll, we'll start a reverse uh, kind of a trend to understand because if we see a bottom-up approach, as you said, we are not finding solutions, maybe a top-down approach, maybe, and we'll need, we'll need like theory of everything, a string theory, we'll need a string theory of uh, fields, equivalent mm -hmm. theory of field. Yeah. Um, and if, if there is some time after you speak, I, I, I'll talk about different kinds of energies which uh, the Bhagavad Gita talks about. Maybe mm -hmm. Uh, that is applicable. I don't know. My answer is going to be shorter than your question, and I'm sorry about that um, because I'm out of my out of my depth here talking about things like panpsychism. I can say a couple things about it. One is everything depends on what you mean by psych. Right? Is it physical, or are you being a dualist, saying there's some some psychic substance out there that's distinct from everything physical? My notion of physical is enormously broad. It includes things you can't touch like gravitational fields, right? So I'm willing to encompass a lot within the physical. But if you're a dualist, I don't know how to answer you. I don't know what a non-physical field would look like. Fields are definitionally physical to me. There's versions of panpsychism, I believe, and again, I'm out of my depth here, which are purely physical, that imagine um, thought and psyche as physical phenomena just not well understood physical phenomena and they can influence phys the physical stuff contained within them just like everything else. So I have no opposition if that's your understanding of, of mind uh, to going that route. Whether the largest fields of all are going to be psychic fields, physical psychic fields, I just have no idea. I mean, there are gravitational fields that span multiple galaxies, span the whole universe, right? and light fields that span the whole universe, all kinds of very large fields out there. Everything would depend on what you meant by psyche, whether there are gonna be universe scale, solar system scale, earth scale, ecology scale, uh, mind-like entities, mind-like fields out there. I meant field of all fields, the field controlling all fields. So, um, a field tells a human body to progress in a specific manner. It tells a tree how to grow. It tells a bird how to go from Antarctica and all mm. the way to Russia and all the yeah. way to India. So yeah. they, uh, they are all different. I cannot fly like a bird. Even if I start walking, I can't reach Antarctica on my own. Uh, but there's a field which tells it how to do it. Uh, I used to believe it is genes, but uh, now I'll probably 
start considering the fact that there could be a field beyond yeah. the gene and uh, but uh, if these fields are so different how do these fields come about you've said that you know it could be could only speculate and probably there's a theory of all fields i don't know maybe i don't i don't want to rule it out um my world is is more I, i'm not sure there are controlling fields nothing controls anything in my world right it nudges you get nudged one way or the other also things that we collapse into one sentence like i want to go to the fridge to get the cheesecake there's many fields involved in wanting that and satisfying that. There's a lot of things I want that are connected with the cheesecake. Along the way, I'm gonna to want to clean up the mess that I spot in the living room. Along the way, I'm gonna to wanna to answer my cell phone that interrupts my trip to the fridge. All these wants are going on. It's a really complicated system. And then the notion of the cheesecake. I like cheesecake, that's one aspect of it. But my left foot has to go first and then my right foot and then my left foot as I walk. That's a different field involved. There's many fields involved in these simple activities that we sum up. I bet a bird migrating south has no one bird migration field governing it. I bet it's 30 different fields that are, that are guiding the end result of which is, is migration. So I'm, I'm happy to have some sort of unification like you propose. I, I see no barrier to it. What I see in the world, though, is enormous complexity, not massive top-down um, uh, coordination of anything. Could be wrong. Open, open to being wrong. It'd be thrilling to be wrong. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and thank you all. This was an enormous amount of fun for me. It was very engaging, and I like looking at everybody. It seems to me that we can go on, like you know, like we could we could easily uh, discuss still for for a few more hours. But the the timing as as we as we have yeah. set up is is like that. So so it's it's time to to stop now. Uh, okay. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, thank you. Very interesting. So, and uh, everybody here, and and Dan, and and everybody in, in the room, please, uh, you know, check check out our program because we have a, a dense schedule for this season. So we will be discussing all sorts of related to, to goal orientedness in the coming weeks. So you are everybody is invited to to join. Let in, me in let me just add that there were a bunch of questions in the chat that I didn't look at, but if anybody wants to email me, I I, I usually answer my email. I will, I will send you I will send you all the questions just for for your reference anyhow and sure okay and the video will be like once it's online I will send it to you as well so we'll be in touch yeah thank, thank you Marta thank you everyone thank you bye bye <laughs>